Am I ready? Cool, all right, clock started. Hey, my name is Lalu, so you know me as Roast Beef. Uh, I'm the CTO of Lightning Labs, and here to talk to you about uh, Taro. Uh, a few different Taro, so we'll get into kind of like this Taro, the one that we release uh, a little bit uh, later, and then kind of go from there. Kind of explain kind of like the high level, exactly what it is, the motivation, how things work, and also kind of like how it's different from other solutions. Um, but now we can get into it. I don't know if this slide is clicking though. Uh, all right, boom. There we go. So first, I kind of go into like exactly what, what is Taro itself, uh, you know, how it is created in structures, uh, and then kind of like how to transfer it, which is kind of like a bigger thing as far as the way it works generally, uh, what the universe, and obviously the most important thing, kind of like how does it integrate with the light network itself, right? So the first, we'll start uh, exactly what is Taro, right? Uh, you know, here's the little shout out. So Taro, it's actually a root vegetable with a taproot structure. It's eaten across many parts of the world, you know, Africa, South America, Asia. It's actually one of the most like ancient kind of like staple crops going back thousands and tens of thousands of years. That bomb left one is actually something from like the 16th century. It's a great source of, you know, manganese, potassium, and also fiber. So here it's picking up for the Bitcoin vegans, Bitcoin vegetarians. Actually, Nigeria is one of the largest producers of Taro in the world as well, too. And on the right, you can kind of like see some different depictions. Uh, that's the actual Taro plant, you know, these chips here. And bottom right, it's something I eat, you know, way back in the day. Like it's kind of like yam, I would call it Nigeria, and egg, that's like a big meal basically, like kind of like a very easy thing to do, uh, and it's really tasty as well too. But uh, I guess you, maybe you mean uh, the other Taro, right? So what Taro is, is basically kind of like a new protocol we developed at Lightning Labs, you know, over the past few months. Uh, what it is, it basically uses Taproot to kind of like allow individuals to issue assets, you know, on the actual Bitcoin chain itself, right? And it does it in a cool way because like given that it uses the Taproot structure, whenever you see an output, you don't actually know what's actually, you know, held in the asset itself. But also it actually uses the Taproot crypt tree to basically allow you to commit to effectively an unbounded amount of assets in a single, um, in a single output, which is really cool. And one of the most important things, is that, like the protocol is oriented, so it can actually be transferred over the Lightning Network, right? So for example, now I can basically, I can, in theory, we pay someone on Bitcoin basically with my own Lightning Wallet, and maybe they receive you know something like LUSD or USD on the other, on the other side as well too. So I think this is a really big step from kind of like you know moving forward. Bitcoin is actually, as far as kind of like Bitcoin being the massive cross center for all of the other you know currencies and assets of the world as well too. Because now all of a sudden like everything is still Bitcoin at the center, but at the edges people can kind of opt into these new protocols as well too. I think it's really going to bring you know expand the network effects of Bitcoin itself, also bringing more and more people into Bitcoin, and also like a lot of them to kind of like you know ease their way into maybe they're initially doing the stable coin, then beyond that they get into more into the core Bitcoin itself. But now let's start to dive into some of the details. So what is taro, right? So it kind of like has like a cool background, you know, in addition to being, you know, a uh, nutritious uh, vegetable. Uh, it's the, ta the taproot asset representation overlay, right? So what's an overlay, right? So what we mean by, oh, by asset overlay is basically it's based on something called embedded consensus, right? An embedded consensus. So rather than kind of like, you know, including all of the data exactly into the chain, like things like, you know, uh, Omni and counterpart, things like that, which kind of like goes to the chain itself, so we basically commit to kind of like a hash of data into the chain itself, right? And we say embedded com consensus because we basically, okay, like we're going to kind of like make up rules as far as how things work and then interpret them and kind of like add additional validation logic and, and alongside this as well, too. So effectively, it's using Bitcoin kind of like most Secure you know, these like blockchain in the world as a publication system, basically, to allow you to commit the data into the chain that we interpret it ourselves. This is really cool because all of a sudden now we don't have to worry about double spend or you know we, need, we don't need a consensus network, we don't need proof of stake, whatever else. We just use the Bitcoin as is today, right? Uh, and like, the one kind of like you know little trick, uh, you know, in Tower basically like rather than actually commit out to all the data on the chain uh, outright, we actually instead commit to things in the, the script tree itself, right? Uh, and as you see in a little bit here, uh, this this is really cool because this kind of like you know has like a very nice structured commitment format, also allows it to be uh, very extensible as well too. And you know, so Tower supports two different kinds of assets. One is basically normal assets, like maybe the are divisible, so maybe these are things like you know cool points, speed bucks, or you know USD, and whatever else. It also supports collections, which are kind of like you know like a limited edition kind of like collectible asset. You know, maybe it's like a holographic beef, beef start card, maybe it's a baseball card, things like that as well too. So you basically do both of those things you know within uh, the actual protocol itself, which is pretty cool. Uh, so uh, people ask me exactly like you know why Taproot? Is it actually needed for Taproot? Is it just like a marketing thing? Uh, you know, well, it's actually you know it's, uh, it's, it's essential in my opinion, right? So something people had in the past something called paid contract hash or P2SH, right? And the way it worked, it basically kind of like you have like a key and you have some data and you basically you know high level you don't get lost in the math you know or the easy stuff. You basically, kind of like commit to some data within a public key itself, right? This is really cool because the public key to a third party observer looks like just like a normal public key. They don't really know what data is actually included with it as well too. So th there was a paper I think by Timo Hanke in like 2013 or so, but that, it never really got used in practice. I think his uh, use cases kind of like using it as like a receipt basically where like you know you have like some like metadata and you would use that metadata to derive Bitcoin address and that would give you kind of like proof of publication and that really came on as well too. But you know one thing about like you know doing something like this uh, just as far as kind of like you know P2SH alone or, P or pay to contract cash alone is that you kind of like intermingle the actual contract details or the asset details along inside the script itself, right? So let's say I was trying to commit to like metadata in, in the actual script. All of a sudden I need to kind of like have that directly on all my other scripts. That's also gonna like bloat the information as well too. But the cool thing about Taproot is like Taproot kind of like gives us like a very structured commitment format, right? And like the way, the way Taproot works is that like you know you can actually 
commit to several different things, but the things that you don't reveal don't actually need to be published onto the chain itself, right? So this is like, okay, like, you know, well, what if we actually commit to other data within the actual Taproot tree itself? And that's kind of like where the idea has been born somewhat, right? And the cool thing about this as well, too, we can actually have like a, a, a um, separation of layers, because we actually have like a new asset script or kind of scripting language in the Taro system itself, too. So first we have like, you know, Bitcoin script and we have asset scripts as well, too. This is really cool, because like, for example, I can have like an asset and maybe it'll require like a multi-sig or other, you know, information as well to actually properly move it. So it's definitely like, you know, a really cool uh, way things are set up. So here's kind of like a high level overview of the way things work, right? So it's basically this new data structure. I'm calling it new, maybe someone has invented it, maybe it's a Bitcoin token from 2012, I don't really know, but for now we'll say it's new, right? Uh, so it's basically something called a Merkle sum sparse Merkle tree, right? And what a Merkle sum uh, tree is, like you know, people have seen Merkle, Merkle tree before, you kind of like have like a series of items, you hash them up pairwise, so you have like an initial root a hash itself, right? But the Merkle sum property basically allows you to kind of like commit to what exactly is like a value, right? So now alongside like committing to a hash, I'm also committing to a value. So let's say I have like a series of elements that all have like a value of one, the root of the tree commits to four, right? Right? Now, all of a sudden, I can say, okay, well, prove to me you have an element of the tree. You give me the actual uh, hash of the data itself, but you also give me this value. Whenever I combine the proof up, I actually add that value alongside of it as well, too. That's a really cool thing, because in, in the context of time, we're going to be using this for things like, okay, I want, you, I want you to prove to me that you have five beef bucks, right? You can basically prove that to me as well, too. The other thing we use in Taro, this also lets me ensure that whenever we do transfers, there's not actually asset inflation going on, right? I want to make sure, that, okay, you sent me five, you should have three left, right? You're not actually making anything out of thin air on, on the other side. Then the other part we have is a sparse Merkle tree. So this is kind of like another thing. Uh, sparse Merkle trees effectively like an index, uh, you know, over kind of like a key value sort of data, right? So the way it works is like Merkle trees are kind of like a list. A sparse Merkle tree is basically a key value map, right? So what we do, we basically take a hash and we, we navigate down the tree going left or right depending on that one or zero. So if it's zero, I go left. If it's one, I go right. And then we go all the way down, you know, 256 levels because it's a 256 bit tree and we get into like kind of like a unique location within the tree itself. This is really cool. The one other cool thing about sparse Merkle trees, the way it works is we can actually do like a very efficient proof of non-inclusion, right? So, you know, for, for in this case, like uh, one other thing I skipped over just now, is like all the elements are initially nil, right? So for, you, for me to prove to you that not, something's not in the tree, I show you a path down to a nil element, right? And that means, okay, well, it's not actually in the tree. This is really cool. Because otherwise, you know, uh, if you're doing it from Merkle tree because it's actually like insertion ordered, I maybe would need to give you a bunch of other leaves aside and things like that as well, too. The other cool thing about a uh, sparse Merkle tree is actually history independent, right? Meaning that, you know, if you and I insert other elements into a tree in like arbitrary order, we get the exact same root hash, right? So you can almost view it as kind of like being able to like, you know, maybe do like a git clone, I pile all my commits on top of it, we check the same head, and we know things are, are correct like that. So this is how it kind of looks on the right over here. So in the top, you kind of like have my initial pub key with the script root. That's kind of like the way taproot works. We have the regular Merkle tree. So you can kind of see I have like a hash of a pre-image, a delay or two, two, whatever else. Then we get into the tower part, right? So the tower part is actually now a series of other nested, uh, you know, sparse Merkle trees, right? So first we have the first level, and that's where we have like all the assets. So bring that up, I have 25 beat bucks and 100 cool points, right? And, you know, so we'll have like kind of like an additional leaf for every single asset we have here. This is kind of where you get some, this is where you get some of the scalability. Because if you look at other systems, whenever you're actually making assets, you need to kind of like, you know, manifest fully like a, a massive map of the asset onto the chain. So maybe you have like a million entry, you basically have a million items in the chain as well too. Maybe it's going to cost hundred thousand dollars to even make an asset in this case. But in Taro, it's basically one transaction. One transaction can move an unbounded amount of assets and also create an unbounded masses as well too. So once again, we're using this like you know very cool tree scaling property to amortize all of these transactions all into one. Then when we go to the next layer down, then we have like the actual, uh, you know, where the assets are stored, right? So that layer is now like using basically like a script hash or the asset key to store the individual values. So if you see that I have like, you know, uh, 10 beef bucks and the 15 beef bucks, and then when I hash those up, I get 25 as well too. And then the, the final layer is basically this like asset, uh, you know, tree uh, or leaf TLV, right? So TLV is a format we made for the Lightning Protocol. It's something like a protobuf. It's kind of like an extensible key value, uh, you know, system. So it's really cool from that point. And the way everything works is that like you basically need like an asset ID, right? So it's kind of like one of the, one of the tricky parts. I think we found a really, you know, cool. Um, so you know, typically in other systems, there's kind of like a global system, or maybe the contract system is actually aware of like a contract hash or an asset ID. But in Tower, we basically need all the asset IDs to be unique. So it's okay, well, how do we get a unique value? Once again, we basically use the blockchain itself, right? Something called BIP34 back in the day, they kind of like, you know, uh, fix an issue in Bitcoin itself, basically make sure every single transaction is actually properly unique, right? And the way they do this, the Comrade transaction now commits to the height, you know, of the actual block, which makes things unique. Um, don't need to get to that too far. But now, because we were able to say, okay, well, we can use that first input, you know, call the genesis point, uh, apply the asset type, which maybe is like a, the name of the asset, maybe it's like hash or something else, there's some asset metadata as well too, and then all of a sudden we can basically use that to have like a unique identifier, right? And we can actually ensure this is like, you know, globally unique because we, we know the assets aren't going to be, re, you know, repeating, um, you know, uh, in, so we know the genesis points aren't going to be repeating in the chain because you never repeat a TX ID. That's kind of like how we do something to get, you know, global unique, uh, you know, asset IDs. This is really cool, and there's some other things as well that you kind of like, you know, manifest asset IDs in a in similar um, tree, and also kind of do a thing where I can like, you know, issue V-Bucks V1 and then V2, but I still have V1 and V2 be actually fungible alongside of each other. 
Uh, so one of the questions, okay, like exactly how do transfers work, right? So I mentioned a little bit earlier that you know things are kind of like you know Bitcoin like, and they kind of like you know really take up from like Bitcoin um, you know, design principles as well too. One of my goals, you know, to creating this new system was to make it very friendly to Bitcoin developers, right? It, it should be you know it should full very native. I don't want to like learn some new language or VM paradigm. I just want to like you know do use all my existing tooling and the way we set things up. Basically, everything can be reused uh, for, for the most part, right? So uh, like I was saying, alongside the TLV, we actually have like inputs and outputs, right? The outputs are kind of like you know my splits, similar to like a UTXO. They also have inputs, right? And the inputs themselves are actually like a new uh, another version of like witness, right? Uh, depending on what you do, maybe you need kind of to prove to me that you're part of something else, but high level of the basic inputs and outputs similar to Bitcoin is like a witness, right? So the one question is, okay, like exactly like, okay, if we're going to add programmability, what do you want to do as far as the VM? So it was like, okay, you know, I, I feel like one thing I think happened to a bunch of other products in the past, like they got a little bit caught up as far as the VM uh, design space and that, okay, well, you can do anything, right? But I think one kind of like, you know, um, kind of a good trait as far as the protocol design is try to like simplify as much as possible, make things, you know, it's really simple to kind of constrain yourself to have something that's like a little more elegant. So what we end up doing, we actually have taproot within taproot, right? So first you basically have the top level taproot key that's, you know, showing everything uh, and committing to the asset itself. But then the actual script, we then, what we do, we basically make a, a virtual transaction, like a one input, one output, use a Merkle sum commitment on all the outputs and all the inputs as well. So verification just says, okay, well, you know, this, these values should be equal, right? So I have like 10 over here and then 10 over here. This, so like, if you give me like 10 to 15, I, mean basically, I know you're inflating something, right? That's a really cool thing. Then we basically take that transaction and we actually run it through the regular Taproot script VM. So we basically gain all the capabilities of Taproot today uh, without really having to, you know, writing new code. And we, and we know this stuff has been very, very well reviewed as well too. So this is basically the version one system, the version new, depending on how you're, how you're accounting it. But in the future, we can actually add new functionality. So, you know, we could add WASM, we could add an entirely new VM, or we can basically even introduce things like we can add covenants or even add new app codes at, at the uh, Taro VM layer, which is really cool as well, too. So one other thing we want to make sure, like we want to make sure that this, actually, this thing's actually like very familiar with people and it's like very easy to use, right? So we actually have this address format. So if if, uh, if you if I was you know, trying to send to you a tower asset on chain, we basically use the big uh, BEC32, like the similar format that we use for separate addresses. And there's kind of like some information that's actually encoded in that like address itself. And that's all the information I actually need in order to recreate the, uh, the 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 script tree and then recreate the output key and then send to that on chain as well too, right? So using the internal key, which is part of Taproot, your asset script key, which is kind of like exactly um, you know uh, how your unlocking works, and also the asset ID, I can reconstruct the tree basically and then create an output and then be able to send you that output on chain as well too. This is really cool because it enables light client support. So one of the passages with some of the prior versions that like, you know they actually use something called operatory, which when you have to you have to had to actually scan the entire chain, kind of like looking for all these updates to see okay and anything you know it's fine to me at all. But in this case I can basically put that address into my you know my neutrino filter, which is light client and then from there I can say okay well I received an asset, let me go and then get the, the final proof and actually be able to spend it as well too. So one other thing that we do to make things, things a little more like client friendly as well too, like so every single asset kind of like defined by its proof. So as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of like a genesis point. The genesis point is basically what's used to uh, drive asset IDs, right? So you know, so for in this case, beef bucks are defined by every asset kind of like you know that's uh, descended from this particular genesis point. Similar to there, where it's like you know, Bitcoin is depend, de descended from the genesis block. Anything that doesn't have the genesis block in isn't the Bitcoin chain. Anything that doesn't have you know my out point and it isn't you know beef bucks as well too, right? So this the, so this kind of like lets you kind of like you know prove and also pr put provenance directly at the kind of like head of the protocol itself. So anytime I'm like you know or something, else, something else, I can then use that to verify to make sure I have a legit asset. I'm not getting scammed, I'm not getting inflated, or anything else like that. Uh, there's another uh, you know, component in the system uh, we're calling a universe. Uh, oh, cool, these are the updated uh, slides, right? So question is exactly what is universe. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you actually need to kind of like, you know, bootstrap um, what's effectively my knowledge of like knowing that the genesis point is a particular asset, right? So this is kind of like, actually like an on-chain structure that indexes into the set of spent out points and then maps that to metadata that is basically the proofs uh, into the chain itself and then also the proofs of the witnesses, uh, you know, as well too, right? And the way it works is that like, um, you know, within the BIP, you kind of like define like some special rules as far as how you, uh, after you create the output, uh, the initial asset missing interaction itself, where you require the second uh, output of the next transaction to actually commit to the root hash of which is what the universe is itself. This is really cool because obviously now I can actually watch a set of outpoints on chain to know when thing, new things are being created and minted alongside things uh, as well too. The other cool thing about universe is that you know once I have this commitment I have extra data, I can then audit and I can like audit the supply of like a particular asset. So like I say it's okay, well there's one billion you know beef bucks in existence basically, right? I can then use this to verify anytime something can like, be created and make sure I'm not accepting two billion because there's only one billion uh, with, with that as well too. So the cool thing is like, you know, someone can kind of like maintain like a canonical universe. You can view it as kind of like a federated matrix server, maybe kind of like a Git repo. But at the same time, because SMTs are uh, history independent, I can collect all the data myself and also make sure I'm verifying that we have the exact same hash. So this is kind of, okay, well, everyone can kind of run the number and actually audit supply all the assets in real time as well, which is really another really cool uh, trade about it as well. Then you can say, okay, well, I can also kind of combine multiple assets, uh, multiple universes into a multiverse, which is kind of like, you know, keeping track of multiple assets and maybe some of the history as well too. There's one other system in there, which is uh, calling a pocket universe, which is a way to kind of like aggregate a bunch of proofs, you know, as far as uh, transfers off chain. Right? So you kind of have like a federated system. Maybe someone's like making a game and the game is closer to anyway. Like maybe we have like some trading card games that's part of the game itself. The operator can basically run this pocket universe and we can actually save a bunch of transfers because with a single transaction they can do effectively an unbounded number of um, transfers uh, within, the, within the system as well. There's different you know, things I'm throwing around as far as making it possible to exit things as well. And then also uh,
So, you know, in the past, we did some things, you know, around kind of like Litecoin swaps on Bitcoin. That was like way, way back, you know, the two chains, many people remember that. But, you know, we're kind of taking a different approach here, right? So rather than actually having all the assets in the core of the network, the assets are basically fully at the edges, right? Which is really cool, because now, like, the core of the network doesn't actually need to update. They're still using Bitcoin as normal, basically. They don't even know this thing is actually updated, right? But instead, we actually push the complexities all the way to the edges and basically have, you know, just Alice and Carol and like, their kind of like initial, um, you know, first and last mile being aware of um, the, the, uh, the, the assets themselves, right? This is really cool because now we don't actually need an entirely new network for every single asset we're creating, right? We can basically use, you know, the hundreds of million dollars, or, you know, 3.7K BTC plus, that's probably out of date already, uh, you know, on the network today, right? This is really cool because now we can actually, you know, retain all the network effects, actually reuse all that liquidity. So now we have, like, more demand for transfers, which means more demand for activity, which means more free revenue, which means the network grows, becomes more useful, and now this is a kind of, like, very cool flywheel, basically. Once again, keeping Bitcoin at the center, so now this kind of positions Bitcoin as kind of, like, the global, you know, crossing layer for any other value, right? I don't really care what's at the edge, but any, any, in the any case, everything is actually crossing in Bitcoin. People in the, in the internal network, in the internal network, they also actually getting all the routing fees in Bitcoin as well. And that's like a really, uh, you know, dope part about the way things are set up. Uh, so the other really important thing is obviously multi-hop, right? Multi-hop is kind of like what changed everything when Lightning came out, okay? Because otherwise, before we get direct channels, it's not very really cool. We want to be able to make sure we're actually riding across the entire network. So, you know, if you, if you recall, actually, Tower has like a scripting system within, within itself. So we can actually remap the existing HLC structure in the Tower scripting system and actually then just have HLCs work normal, right? So now my multi-sig commits to a, a, a asset tree, which basically, uh, you know, mine and your balance. HLCs now manifest, you know, both on the HLC layer, but also on the Tower layer as well, too. We, can, we then actually use this to actually handle a multi-hop uh, with that way everything works. And the thing, the way it works is kind of like, you, you can do like kind of like a little trick of like the invoice kind of like does most of the work, right? So today, like whenever you're using Bitcoin, uh, and maybe you're using like Lightning, like maybe it says like USD on the left side, but then you actually get a Bitcoin invoice, right? Someone quoted a rate, some conversion happened there. People would probably just pay, they don't really think about it, right? But in the way this works, it's like, okay, now like you know, if I'm sending from Dave and I'm Alice, Dave gives me an invoice, that invoice now has that USD amount basically. Now it's my job to kind of like, you know, route everything uh, properly with the network in order to Dave. So if I send too little, Dave's gonna cancel back. It's okay, I want a 10 set, you, you, you send me nine set, right? So it's a pretty elegant way of kind of like, you know, pushing the edges, and also making sure that everything is primarily on the wallets as well, too. Really excited about this, and like, so it's going to implement as a kind of like a series of extensions onto the boat protocol, right? Uh, you know, maybe kind of like a blip format, where you can kind of like add additional metadata to, you know, funding, and also HLCs as well, too. So it's kind of a really cool thing where people can opt into it. If no one, people want to use it, that's fine. They can enjoy, you know, the increased transfer and the, the increased demand activity from all these new tower, tower transfer, but now all of a sudden we can do things like, you know, go up more directly after credit cards. Maybe if people can, like, you know, so I can, in theory, I can send, you know, BTC, and the merchant receives USD on the other side, so now everything's fully onto the uh, actual Bitcoin system as well. And one other thing as well, too, this is going to really dramatically reduce any of the cost of the on and off ramps, right? Because now all of a sudden it's already kind of like, you know, in the uh, Bitcoin lane, right? They don't need to worry about like going to an exchange, doing all that stuff or whatever else. You can actually do a bunch of really cool things. The other cool thing about the way the tower works, because it's all like, you know, fully Bitcoin input and output, we can actually kind of like have like non custodial swaps of anything, you know, on the actual Bitcoin chain itself. And what's a swap? It's a multi input, multi amount transaction, basically moving things back and forth. Uh, and that's Taro. And if you think this is cool, we're hiring a Lightning Labs, you know, many different positions, you know, researchers, engineers, people on front end, managers, talent, engineering as well too. You can check out our job listings on the website and also maybe email us if you don't see anything that's on there that you think is cool and you want to kind of like get into. But yeah, that's Taro. Thank you. <laughs>